Hello folks, it's your friend Bernie here and we're back with another special Visionaries Co-working Values podcast which is a collaboration between Jose, Zara and myself and Olga and Igor and the ANCARS team and we're taking you on a 12-month journey here of uh, very deep divey episodes for people who are outside the usual suspects you normally find in the uh, when you put the word co-working into Google. So this episode is um oh god i don't list of things here and i don't know where to begin but it, it's Lindsay from lamb in stockholm talking with jose and there's there's a few key words here is she talks like a theme running through the whole podcast is about the movement and then she elegantly describes the the difference between like i'm renting an office and i'm renting somewhere to work in a co-working space and there's a story in the podcast about the the mayor of Lamb, who is an employee in a company, and how he's he's been able to go to Lamb and take part in the classes and the workshops and tea party. And instead of like going to get his work done, he's gone to get his work done and worked out how to make time for himself. And he's just something like he's worked out how to make time for himself and give the energy to the things that really matter in him. And that might sound a little bit cute, but I have definitely, in the last 13 years, been a member of a co-working space where the uh, atmosphere and the community ebbs and flows in a really good way. And I've been able to sort of work out my priorities, even though arguably I'm just going into a building and doing my work every day. And I think that's the that's the difference between uh, renting a desk in a building to plug into the internet and get your work done and then being part of a co- co-working community. And you hear people a lot around our co-working assembly family talk about the difference between the industry and the movement. And what you hear in this podcast from Lindsay and Jose kind of connects those two things very well. I absolutely love it here at NAM. I've been a full-time member for a little while now and I've met so many incredible people. The place is wonderful, my productivity has improved. They have all these lovely workshops on, meditation booths, stand-up desks, nuts available if you get hungry. It really, really is a wonderful, wonderful place to work. Probably the best co-working space I've ever worked from. So if you're looking for a place to increase your productivity and output, to meet wonderful people, and just somewhere that can feel like home when you're working, then I would highly recommend checking out LAM. Hi, my name is Lindsay Hieronskog, and I am the CEO and co-founder of LAM, a co-working space in Stockholm that is purpose-built with everything a human being needs to thrive at work. Lindsay, thank you for accepting our invitation to this episode of Visionaries. This is a new series, part of the Coworking Values podcast, focused on stories of exceptional coworking operators. Let's begin with some context. How is the coworking market in Stockholm? So the co-working market in Stockholm is growing really quickly. Uh, I would say of the Nordic countries, it's got one of the more sort of established um, sort of co-working uh, model and has been adopted. But I think that there, we have an interesting thing in Stockholm where there is a difference between co-working and something in Swedish that's called kontorshotel, which is basically like office hotel. And I think what's interesting in this market is that those two terms get interchanged a lot. And I think it creates a lot of confusion in the minds of customers about what it actually is. Um, I mean, I think both at the heart of it, that's a serviced office offering, but the added benefit with co-working instead of an office hotel is the community aspect and the people aspect and the and having them in the focus. Um, so I would say that the co-working market in general in Stockholm is much more skewed to this office hotel uh, side of things, even though they call themselves co-working. And you have a lot of really big actors and the number of co-working spaces taking up commercial space in Stockholm has been growing a lot in the last few years and it's become a really popular offering. But the number of co-working spaces that I think that do what we do, which is with a really strong focus on people, on the community, on how we can better serve them, 
that would represent a much, much, much smaller proportion of the sort of total co-working market in Stockholm. And it would be amazing to see that grow because I think it's something that the city needs. In your view, what's the co-working hotel's value proposition? I mean, I think it's a pure economic play. You know, for them, they, they can offer a serviced office where a company can come with their team and they don't have to think about the Wi-Fi or the cleaning or the coffee or anything like that. And they have short-term leases and they don't have to make the commitment and they get to provide an office space for their employees. But the problem is, is it's only an office space and you could be providing so much more. From your perspective and in contrast, what is a co-working I mean, In our mind, it's the whole ecosystem of work, right? Because the physical environment that you spend your time in impacts so much of your experience of work. And when you are only focusing on the functionality of physical space, I have my desk and I have my chair and I sit here and this is where I do my work, or that is the meeting room where I go to take my meetings, you're missing a huge part of what makes work work, which is the physical environment informs everything about what you can and can't do in the office, what's accepted, what isn't accepted, what's possible, what isn't possible. And it also dictates the level of collaboration and sense of belonging that you have with other people. And I think that in a serviced office proposition, where you're really purely just talking about four walls, desks, and chairs, you're really missing a huge piece of the bigger picture of work, which is the ecosystem. I love the name Lamb. How did it come around? Oh, there's a good story behind the name. Um, so if I sort of go back to the beginning, I can be super honest with you and tell you that the intention from the beginning was never to start a co-working space so that we would be co-working operators. Our ambition really was to fix something that's pretty fundamentally broken with work and more specifically with our work environments. Um, you know, we've, we've built up this habit in our cultures of expecting that when we're at work, we're almost like work robots and that we somehow lose the ability or lose the need for sort of these really fundamental things that we really are proactive about seeking in our private lives, connection with other people, our physical activity and staying healthy and exercising, uh, the way that we eat, the way that we you know, practice mindfulness, all of those things seem to have been relegated to our personal life. And that to us seemed insane because so many of those things have a huge impact on your work life. And so we wanted to build a space that was going to make it easy for people to take care of those needs during the workday and to put them in focus so that it becomes a part of the culture and the ecosystem of work to be thinking about these sort of fundamental things we need as human beings during the workday and let that be the thing that then trickles out into your personal life rather than vice versa, because that prospect is not one that's worked, right? It hasn't managed to affect the workday in that way. And so we set out to create a work environment, sort of changed the standard, the accepted standard for what work can and should be like. And we started it we opened our doors back in 2021. We, st we started with the idea during a pandemic and now have run it through a pandemic and now an economic crisis and, and energy crisis and food crisis and everything that's going on. So it's it's been a really interesting journey, um, but we've sort of stayed true to what our original mission was. And it really has been to how do we make this easier for people? And it comes from a personal place and a personal experience. I was a marketing and branding consultant and worked in-house at a fintech company. And I had these wonderful experiences, but the work environments felt completely broken. And I had one particular experience before I left to start LAM, which I almost, I basically almost burnt out because the expectations in the work environment were built in such a way that even though I was a type A, high performer, really with a huge capacity for work, I still couldn't hit the expectations that were laid out on the table for me. And I felt like this is just something that's got to change. And then in combination with that, I s had the experience of watching my sister work for the same company for 13 years that had a really toxic culture and work environment. And she burnt out twice, really painfully, 
And it was really hard to watch because there are a lot of things that you can do to manage the stresses and the pressures of work. And there's a lot of things that we can stop doing immediately in our work environments that will immediately benefit people and help them feel better and thrive at work. And it was so frustrating to me that she didn't know how to do that stuff. And I couldn't convince anybody at my company to do that stuff. And it felt super frustrating that we were ignoring something that to me felt super clear, that we know how we work as human beings. We know the kind of stuff that we need to to be at our best, and yet we we don't do those things. And I looked at the landscape of work, and I sort of looked at what my future would look like, and I thought, my God, th- this has got to change. And the name Lamb is my daughter's nickname. And for me, the motivation to not just build a co-working space, but to create a movement where we actually see a shift in our work environments so that they actually support people is important to me because I don't want my daughter to enter the working world with the same conditions that we are faced with today. I like so much the idea of building brands that hold so much meaning, like your intention of creating better working environments for the generations to come. The problem LAMP solves is creating environments to support people in their work. You call it a movement because that is required if we want the next generations to start their careers better than we did. Am I right? Yeah. And I mean, I think a lot about what we're trying to do is go, okay, we know that there's a mental health crisis and we know that people are getting sick with stress. We're so stressed we're getting sick. Our bodies are shutting down because we're so stressed. And I think we're looking at the issue and going, wait a minute, why in the world has the accepted way to solve this become you, employee A, have an individual responsibility to fix this, but do it on your own time when you have a work ecosystem. You have companies, you have co-working spaces, you have a whole group of people who have all come together around the same idea, whatever that might be, who all have a vested interest in belonging to this group, who if you actually built something with intention to say, we want people to feel good, we want them to be able to contribute their best at work, and we understand the conditions that we need to provide in order for that to happen. And then you go, okay, we're just going to, we're going to do that. And it's really simple stuff. And when you do it in a group, you have that positive peer pressure effect that, that encourages people to do it, that creates a level of accountability around it. And that makes it easier to do it because you're doing it with other people, right? You're doing something that is a little bit hard, but you're doing it with other people, which always makes it easier. And, and I think that's the sort of part of this that, that we're sort of saying, you're not alone here, you know, that that you go through your work day and you feel at the end of the day completely dead because you have no energy or you're having trouble focusing or you feel really stressed or you feel overwhelmed because you just have way too much to do, right? There are some really simple science-backed strategies to tackle all of that, but it's really hard to do it on your own. But then you bring a group of people together to do it together, and all of a sudden, it becomes so much easier. So for us, it just feels like, why in the world have we not built our work environments in this way before? Because everything in a work environment is, is, all, is set up to help a strategy like this succeed. You're building a space where people can be themselves. That's a process of creating a culture of inclusion, tolerance, innovation space where people feel safe to grow. Are your team and co-founders aligned with your philosophy and objectives? I mean, we're so aligned in terms of philosophy and objectives. It is the reason why we're co-founders. So when I first started LAM, I started it with somebody else. I started with, with another woman. And I don't think that now looking back, our visions were aligned, which now, of course, makes sense why we decided to go separate ways. Um, So when we did that, 
last year, we decided to, to go separate ways. I became the solo f- founder. I became the founder. And we were, um, I was going through a, a huge process of soul searching in terms of my role in, as, as the leader, my role as the founder, what would, what was Lamb, what did I want Lamb to become? And already at that point, we had two people in the company who are the most important people to me in the entire world, except for my daughter. And they just happened to be my husband and my baby sister. How I ended up working with these two extraordinary, unbelievable individuals, I will never know, but I am a huge believer in the universe and everything happens for a reason. Uh, And I never set out to start a family company. But when you have a startup and you need a lot of help and you don't have any money to pay them, it really helps to bring in family who is looking for their next opportunity. And it was funny because after the split with my original co-founder, there was a lot of conversation around what the company would become and how it would be run. And it became really clear to me that I did not want to be a solo founder. I do not thrive in having that kind of responsibility on my shoulders. And we had a lot of really big conversations about what is the impact that we want to have here? Ultimately, what are we trying to do and achieve? And it was through that process where it just became so crystal clear that all of us felt so passionately and strongly because of our individual experiences leading up to that, that this type of shift this shift towards a much more human-centric business culture and how the physical office environment can support that in such a huge way, especially when you comp- when you pair the physical environment with the culture. Oh my God, the shift that you can make is incredible. And to see us all aligned behind that and get so excited with that burning passion of like, yes, this is the big hairy problem we want to solve. That was when I asked them, will you be my co-founders? And they said like 100%, absolutely. It would be the honor of our lives to do this. And so now we're three who run the business together. And then we have uh, some other team members that also help us out. Um. But I'm I'm the CEO and the chief marketing officer. Uh, Tori, my sister, she does sales and Dennis does operations. And that's the other funny thing. You know, we've got three people with really complementary skill sets that that don't overlap and work really well together. It's amazing how things fall into place, right? But that's the thing, you know, when when stuff falls into place like that, you just get this feeling of like, yes, this is happening because it needs to happen. Like we are in exactly the right place at exactly the right time, trying to tackle exactly the right problem. Now, I don't know if that's actually true, but it does help to believe that. It keeps that fire in the belly. I think it's true. Finding validation for our ideas in what we perceive as happening around us might be one of the most brilliant things we can do. We're surrounded by communities of social entrepreneurs, social innovators, and progressive businesses all of them trying to solve a riddle. How to create environments where we can achieve our potential in harmony with the rest and our planet. Yeah. And do it together. Do it with people who are going to support you and who are going to support you even if you stumble or you don't really know how to do it. People you can lean on. People you can ask questions to. People who care about your well-being. And, you know, you get that sometimes in a company environment and for the smaller companies, the individuals, the solo entrepreneurs, the people who are really trying to make it in small groups or completely on their own, that support is everything. It makes the difference between surviving and thriving. And I think that that's such an important distinction. I think that we have gotten used to surviving. I think that we have accepted that surviving in your work life is okay. And I think what we want to do is put a stake in the ground and go, it's not okay to just survive. This is your life. 
You get one chance at this. You deserve to thrive. You deserve to have the right conditions so that whatever it is that's in you that needs to come out through your business or through teamwork or through your role in a, in a company, whatever needs to come out should be able to come out and it should feel good when it comes out. We all deserve that opportunity. And if just making some adjustments to the work environment and being a little bit more human in our approach and acknowledging the sort of biological needs we have for rest and movement and mindfulness and connection and growth, then we should do that. Keeping in mind that uh, LAMP is a young initiative, have you seen some impact already? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, so we just had... We just had a really interesting experience now. We had a we had a bigger client, a much bigger one than we usually do. Um, and they were they were with us for six months. And it was a big fintech company with two hundred people. They had an office, but it was too small for them. They needed a place to be for six months to offer their staff, not full time, but whenever they wanted to come in, because a lot of the staff was working from home as well. They wanted to offer them uh, another place to go before the new office was going to be opened six months later. And it was really interesting to see this these people from this company come in and the way that they behaved in the space. And in the beginning, it was really funny. You could see the other members sort of go, "Who are these guys? They don't, uh, they don't, they don't feel like the rest of us." But I think that it was such an incredible experiment because the way that they were in the beginning, you know, they came in and they treated it like a normal office, right? They booked their meeting rooms. They sat down to work. They didn't really talk to a lot of people except for their own colleagues. You know, a lot of the sort of habits that you have, you know, you nobody, none of those people were using our gym and none of them were using the retreat rooms and they were just sort of sticking to themselves. And then you started to see as the months went by this evolution and the way that they started changing their behavior. They started integrating into the community more and they started talking to people outside of their company. They started going to some of our exercise classes. They started getting into conversations with the LAM staff. They started using our retreat rooms. And you could see how their whole approach just started to really soften and how they really started to just melt into the community. To the point where when they were about to leave and they had already gone and seen their new office and they saw the design and how it was set up and everything like that. And they came back and they sort of would whisper to us sort of, we don't want to go. We don't like our new office is nice and everything, but like this, this is heaven. This is this is amazing. We don't want to I don't want to lose this access to these things. I don't want to leave this community. I don't want to leave this approach. Because I think for a lot of them, it felt like kind of going back to the sort of old way of doing things. And they had seen a new way and gone, well, well, that's what, what we want. Um, and I think those types of shifts, especially when you looked at a huge group of people, were so interesting. And then, of course, when you talk to people on an individual level, you know, you you can see this transition. We have a member here and we jokingly call him the mayor of Lamb because this is a guy who had been working from home. He's one employee in a company that's based in a city in the south of Sweden. And when he first came in, he came in really not necessarily knowing what to expect, but really game for the whole experience and had this attitude of, I'm just going to embrace everything. And he in the beginning would come in and he would work and do his thing and then he started going to our classes and he wasn't just going to exercise classes he was going to like our afternoon tea which we have once a month and it's just an open discussion it's always scheduled for 45 minutes and it goes for two hours because everybody opens up and starts talking about their vulnerabilities and their fears and things that they're facing challenges on he started talking to every single member he started using the retreat rooms regularly, taking breaks during his day. He was a regular in the gym and to this day still is. And I think he is such a wonderful poster boy for this change that we're trying to make. And what he says about being here is, first of all, he's like, 
I can't imagine not being a part of this community. He said he recently hurt his back and had to stay home for a couple days. And he said, after two days, I just, I miss this place so much. Like, I don't care how much my back hurts. I just need to be here. And the most important shift had been, he said, now I understand how I, how I take care of myself so that I have the energy for the stuff that's important to me. Like, I didn't know that before. And that type of shift is so incredibly powerful when you see it in a person and you observe them going through this change. And and it just, it kind of makes my heart explode, this whole thing about this experience that he had, that he has had here at Lamb, that he has every day here at Lamb. I just want as many people as possible to be able to experience that. And it's hard to imagine that there's a lot of people out there that just, they don't know the difference. And I, I want, I just so badly want to, to shift them to that place of, wow, I didn't know it could be like this. And it's so funny because we had, um, we do a, a art show. Uh, once every six weeks we have local artists who show their work in our space and we do like a little uh, get together mingle when we put up a new art show and his girlfriend came to this art show and we met her and we were chit-chatting and everything and he stepped away and she sort she sort of pulled us aside and she and she just went, she went thank you she, she said thank you this space this community has changed him she's like this is like it's like daycare for him. It's just, it's amazing. He comes home with so much energy and so many ideas and he's in such a good mood. She's like, thank you. This is just the perfect space for him. It is amazing to me to count impact by the number of persons that improve their lives because of the initiative that we started. Yes. Couldn't that the whole thing? Right? Like whatever that life is you want to live and it looks different for every single person. Like what are the simple, consistent things that you can do to, to get there? And that's, I think, the other thing that we're really trying to, to, to educate people about is that we always think that if we're going to improve our lives, it's got to involve some big, giant project and it's got to involve changing all these different things in our life and it's a monumental effort that just feels way too big to undertake and our perspective is no we want to start from the other end start with one small shift and do it for a couple of minutes a day and do it long enough that it starts to feel natural and then make a second shift and then make a third and let it take time and let it be slow and build on your wins because that's how we change as human beings. And so it is through this like simple, simple, easy changes that your life starts to change. And then all we've done is build the physical environment around making those small changes as easy as humanly possible to do with the support of a community that's all trying to do the same thing. Making such a positive and impactful vision a reality is tough making organizations sustainable and business models work is an art. How do, you, how do you see LAMP's business model evolving? I mean, we do have a traditional co-working business model in that we offer memberships and we rent space. Um, so we sort of, we have that as our foundation. What we are interested in, obviously, is the impact. So the way that we see our business model evolving and, and and this includes some offerings that we already that we already have is okay we have this approach here that works and we kind of see this space as a living lab where we can test things and we can try new things and see what works and see what people respond to but ultimately i think the really interesting part of the model is how do we scale the approach and then for us it's about how do we package this and figure out a way to show other companies how to do what we've done, right? Because we're never going to get to that thing, that, that big, hairy, 
mountain that we want to climb, we're not going to get to the top of that, of changing the standard of what our work environments look and feel like if we don't make this approach available to as many people as possible. So we offer, right now we're starting to offer consulting services where we will, we will work with a company in an advisory capacity for how to actually implement this model into their, into their physical space, into their culture. Um, and that's sort of the big, if you really want to adopt this model, then you can go that direction. And then there's sort of smaller touch points, which, which take the form of workshops that we do. We do these original workshops and we do these team experiences. So it's like basically like an offsite. And, and that's a way to dip your toe in the water of what we're doing and just experiment with it if you're not ready to commit to sort of the full transformation. Long, long term, I would really, I think we, we all see in the founding team an opportunity to digitize this in a really smart way in terms of, in service of making it as easy as humanly possible to make these small shifts. Um, so a digital platform of some kind that would allow us to scale this approach and allow us to make it easy and seamless for people to adopt these sort of small changes, especially at an organizational level, because I think the challenge that we have is you want to create a shift in the culture using the physical space as a jumping off point and culture change at big organizations is not always an easy thing and so any tool that you have that can make sure that it's as easy as possible for as many people as possible to adopt these small changes you increase the chances that you will be able to make a shift within the culture rather than this sort of like top down, the leadership decides it's going to be like this now, which is an important piece of it. But you need people on the ground to adopt that shift and be like, I want this. I feel better this way and encourage each other to do it. And then you still have that culture shift from the top down. So I think long term, it is going to be a lot about um, how do we help companies make this change? Um, because that's where you're really going to scale it. Some time ago, a friend shared with me that the company he works for allows their employees to work from home. But he found a problem. When he returned to the office, everyone wanted to talk to him and he couldn't concentrate on his work. He confides that uh, it would be ideal for him to have a secret space between his home and the job offices uh, to focus on what he needs to do without distractions. What do you think about that? Well, to be honest with you, we have a we have an idea about this. And I mean, the truth is like that is something that's so broken about about work, the fact that we just don't prioritize focus at all because my issue or my need is so much more important than yours. So I'm going to come and bother you and ask you, "Do you just have 2 seconds?" And then that context switching just completely kills you. Uh, but I got my question answered. So so there needs to be a shift in the way that we think about boundaries in the workplace. One of the ways that we enforce boundaries here is we have a focus area. So we have a level here. It's it's the library. The library is a completely silent area. You are not allowed to talk there. You are not allowed to come up to anybody or poke them on the show. Like if somebody is sitting in the library, it's it's you can't you can't you just leave them alone. And then in addition to that, to reinforce the boundary, we have these boundary cards. It's super simple. They're like a postcard size thing. And it it is inspired by an Argentinian steakhouse approach. So, you know, when you go to a steakhouse uh, and you, you sit down at the table and they just bring meat, 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 it, or like on this, everything. I mean, like they'll just bring endless meat. And then you have like a little a little disc and on one side it's red and on the other side it's green. And you put it on the table. And if you want more meat, you put the green side up. And if you are totally full and you don't want any more meat, you put the red side up. Well, we've taken that approach with these really simple postcards. And if you have the green side up that says, I'm focusing, then you're not to be disturbed. And if you have the other side up, the white side up that says, I'm up for chatting, then you can be disturbed. And it's such an easy way to communicate boundaries. And this is the kind of stuff 
that we want to teach everyone to do because we all have the need to be able to focus at work. We all have stuff that we need to get done. And for whatever reason, we have not intentionally carved out any space for that work to be done unless you work from home, which is kind of crazy because then we come into a situation where you go, well, home is for focus and work is for socializing. But if you stay at home for a full day, nobody's focusing for eight hours. If you go to work during, you know, for a day, nobody's socializing for eight hours. There needs to be the ability in whatever environment you're in to have those different pieces in the same day, but with healthy boundaries around them so that you can design your day so that it actually works for you. You have it so clear that I really see how a digital solution could guide people when they see their focus off or productivity down. The digital side of things is really exciting because instead of doing it in an analog way, you can really bring in some of the cool science-backed, data-backed tools that have been proven to work over and over and over again. So just for focus, for example, you know, it would be so much easier with a digital tool to be able to tell people, okay, here are the three things you need to get focus work done. Number one, snooze all your notifications and make sure that nobody can bother you digitally. All right, then have your, you know, have your boundary card next to you so nobody can disturb you physically. Okay, number two, set a timer for 25 minutes or 45 minutes of productive focused work and then take five minute breaks. And then number three, put on a playlist of focus music or binaural beats to boost that focus even more. And then you'd be able to serve them up these three very easy, tangible science backed tools to improve your focus in such a, a, a seamless way that just goes, yep, okay, I did that. Yep, okay, I did that. Yep, you're, it's your focus checklist. And you've given, your chance the, you've given yourself the best chance possible to succeed. And then, and, and I think the outcome of, of just something small like that is exactly what we're after. The outcome of having a period of focus work and fulfilling the conditions that actually allow you to focus, the outcome of that is you feel accomplished, productive, it boosts your self-esteem, it boosts your mood, it calms your nervous system. And what, like, that's the thing that we want to talk about. What impact does that have? Just that one, let's say it's a two-hour period and you get those four benefits afterwards, how does that change the way that person interacts with the next person they talk to or how they feel when they go home at night to their partner or their pets or their kids? How does it change how they behave in a meeting later that afternoon? How collaborative they are, or how creative they are. And this is where I think it's so exciting to talk about small changes because the impact that you can have knock-on effect is so huge and we're talking about really simple stuff Lindsay so tell me what is the culture code pledge that I saw on your website the culture code is all about setting an expectation for anybody who joins this community because what was really important to us in the beginning was that we did not get into this business to provide a serviced office. We are in the business of trying together to improve your life, our life, everyone's life in this community. And for us, it became important to say, this is a partnership. This is not us providing a service to you and you're the customer and the customer is always right and we will do everything we can to make you happy. We do that anyway, but that this is a partnership. This is 50-50, right? We will come with our knowledge and our passion and our best practices that we know work, and we'll do everything we can to improve your work day. But you have a responsibility too as a member of this community. And these sort of things that we ask people to sign off on, you know, the parts of the culture code of, 
uh, being generous and including everybody and being vulnerable and sharing with respect. These are really important pieces if you're going to build a culture that is centered around what is best for human beings. And for us, it felt like a really simple but powerful way to ensure that anybody who joined this community was on the same page as us, that they saw it the same way, that they believed the same thing that we believed, and that they were willing to commit it, commit to it, that they were willing to sign their name under it and say, and be held to that standard, because we do hold members to that standard. And so far, we have gotten... I mean, it's one of when we show people the culture code, it's one of the reasons why they're even more happy to sign their membership agreement than they were before. But it's also a reason for people to choose us over something, another space, because it is about this collaboration. It is about this shared sense of this is our community and this is my role in it. And I think, you know, when we're talking about stuff like, taking breaks or moving your body or being mindful, all the things that people need to thrive, that's all about creating expectations. And that's what the culture code is about, is about creating a shared set of expectations of like, I know you're going to meet me in this way and I will meet you in this way. Tell me more about vulnerability. Why do you think it is so important? Because there is no way to change as a human being without vulnerability. And that is essentially what we're asking people to do here. We're asking them to do things differently. And in order to do something differently, you have to have an awareness and you have to have a willingness to look at where your potential roadblocks to change might be. And if you can't be vulnerable about, if you can't open up and share that and share the journey that you're going on, in an effort to improve yourself or your life, uh, we're not really going to be able to make any meaningful change. The sur- it'll be surface level, you know, it'll be. And I think that when you are trying to do things differently, the, the thing that is the difference between success and failure often is the support that you get from other people. And if you don't have a willingness to be vulnerable you're not going to create a genuine connection with somebody else. And without a genuine connection, there can be no genuine support. So for this to work, you need to have a willingness to say, I'm going to be open with the stuff I'm struggling with, the where I've stumbled in the past, the stuff I might need help with. And through that, then you create an amazing foundation for everybody to sort of say together, look, we're not after perfection, we're after progress. And as long as we take a step forward and we do it together, then we're on the right track. With all that said, I'm very curious about who are your members? The majority of our customers are, I would say, still on the solo entrepreneur, consultant, coach type background, they work by themselves. Um, But increasingly, we are attracting more small teams who, for them, it would never make sense to have their own office. So a co-working space is, is perfect for them. But they come to us because they're looking for something else. And, um, and I think that our values align really well with, with, with certain parts of that demographic, because when you're a small business owner and you have a small team, you wear so many different hats and it is really, really hard. You know, I mean, like, I think we talk a lot about the solo entrepreneur and the one man band and the consultant and everything. That is a, that is a tough, that is a, is a wonderfully rewarding, but very tough journey. I think we talk less about the challenges that a small business owner faces, who is not just the CEO and the founder and the one to drive most of the innovation that is going on within the organization, but a lot of times they're also the office manager and the invoicer and the payroll specialist and the workplace experience manager. And they're wearing so many different hats. And 
what I think that they really like about this is that yes, they get a, a they get a serviced office, but their team also gets to be a part of a really strong and supportive community, which strengthens them as a team because it inspires and it provides opportunities for creativity and new ideas. But beyond that, essentially what we're giving them is if you sit here, you will have a sustainable culture that's focused on human beings without you having to figure out what that looks like for your company. Like, we will take care of that for you. And I think that that is a value add and is, and is a tool to teach leaders about what this looks like and, and to do the heavy lifting for them rather than them having to reinvent the wheel is huge for them because it allows them to focus on what is most important for them, right? Which is for, for the founder of a company, it's innovating and creating and supporting their team, but not but supporting their team in a way that's really enjoyable and fun. And it's not about having to do the heavy lifting of setting a foundation and, and all that. It's more of the what kind of culture do we want in the company and how can we build on this culture that's here for for our relationship with each other. Helping companies and teams to develop human-centered cultures is such an amazing value proposition. I think so too. Business as usual is such a challenge. There's so much pressure when you're starting your own business. Like I can say that as a founder, like it is just marathon after marathon after marathon and you you're just you're you love it but you're exhausted and the pressure is insane. And it is really easy to distill your job down into numbers and cents. But everything you're creating is made by people for people in one way or another. And we can't afford to lose sight of that. And if it means that somebody like a company like Lamb is a partner in making sure that nobody loses sight of that, amazing. Right. Like out, you know, and it's not even about outsourcing. It's about co-creating it together. Like you're going to get so much out of being here and you're going to solve so many of the cultural building block issues that you have when you have a small company and you're going to come with your needs and we're going to do it together. Everything makes so much sense. So you have on one side the co-working space, you have a methodology and a vision so big that doesn't fit in a building. It scales as services, as consulting, as products. It's just amazing. Lindsay, I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. I, it's, it's so uh, fulfilling to have the opportunity, uh, thanks to this podcast, to talk and share knowledge uh, with other persons. I think that we need more and more spaces of conversation and sharing. It's a way of remembering. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of refocusing. Uh, so I'm deeply grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was a pleasure. What does LAM mean to me? Well, to be part of building and facilitating a work culture that is healthy and sustainable and actively helping others achieve this goal, it makes me real proud. And the benefit of the practices woven into the fabric of labs where to buy all life makes the joy double. And to top it off with the amazing community I get to spend time with every single day, I'm truly living a life where work does not work against me. If I would describe LAMB in just a couple of sentences, it will be, it's like receiving a big warm hug when you enter this place. The atmosphere, the people, the love and the energy you get from being here makes me eager and excited to come back when the weekend ends. 